Welcome to Last Call with Jamie and Christian. Our guest this week, one of the best coaches in the country for a very long time and now killing it on TV right now, Bruce Weber. Coach Weber, how are you? I'm fine. I don't know if I'm killing it on TV, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to say and not to say. Well, you know, that's always part of it. And But, you know, your knowledge and understanding of the game and what's going on, on the floor, I feel like really resonates well with, with uh, the audience. So, you know, maybe you're being hard on yourself early on. I think you're doing a great job. Well, I appreciate it. It's, it's good to stay involved. Um, obviously, college basketball has been part of my life for whatever, 43, 44 years or whatever. So uh, it's hard to get it out of your blood. And, and I thought this was one way to just stay connected and, um, you know, be part of it. I, I love going to practices. I love, as you know, just, you know, visiting with coaches and, um, you know, just being around the players the whole bit. And, uh, you know, but it's different because it's not your team anymore. And, uh, and I guess the, they all, all the announcers tell me you can go home and, and after the game and not have to stress and all that stuff. But, you know, I think that was part of it. I think we, as a coach, you love that stress and you love helping people. And every day you got up and you had some kind of purpose. Yeah. What is it, you know, again, 43 years in, in basketball. Uh, what is it that you're getting to see in other people's practices now that you're really taking from? Well, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I, you don't, I tried to go to practices actually as a, as a college coach, I tried to go to, you know, you go to high school practices all the time. And, you know, I, I always told our coaches, you know, watch for drills. Cause you never know somebody, every, you know, everyone copies somebody and somebody went somewhere or to a clinic or a practice and found a drill. Uh, but I also like to go to NBA practices uh, as a college coach and, I had my, one of my last chances uh, a year ago, I coached Popovich, got to go down for the Spurs for a couple of days. And, you know, you're always learning. I think that's the great part of being involved in college basketball, just growing and learning and keeping go moving forward. And, you know, now I think, I guess my biggest fear for coaches, especially the young coaches, is they're afraid to coach the guys. Uh, and, and you don't have to throw chairs and you don't have to, you know, cuss them out and all that stuff, but you gotta, you gotta coach them. You gotta demand from them. Um, you gotta have discipline. You gotta have, you know, some type of plan for them. And, um, I guess when I watch practices, that would be my biggest alarm right now with some of the young guys. I don't know if it's the NIL, if it's, uh, the portal, whatever it is, uh, you know, you got to you, you got to get after them a little bit. And and uh, hopefully I think some when I talk to young guys and I know you've been going around the practices and meeting with coaches, I've done the same thing this this fall. And that's the one thing I've kind of emphasized to them. Yeah, I've been amazed. It's funny you say that, because that's something that I've been really amazed about. You know, I, I always felt like I always tried to get all my coaches involved in practice and in coaching in some regard, whether it's pulling a guy's, you know, one-on-one -on, -one on the side or whatever. And I'm sort of amazed at going to practice and watching one person sort of dominate the entire time. Um, I've been shocked by that. Yeah. You know, it's something I, I learned from my boss, coach Katie, um, obviously one of the greatest coaches of all time. And uh, you know, he always told us, you know, 10 eyes were better than two eyes, you know, five brains were better than one brain. And, you know, he, he wanted us involved in practice and, you know, some people, I think it's a threat. Um, some people think it's chaos, but to me, I, that's, what's the game. It's chaos. When you're out on the court, you're on opponent's mm -hmm. court, you know, and the crowds are going crazy and you got to react, you got to deal with difficulty. And, um, you know, so you, you, you have to coach them, uh, you you know you 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 have to coach them hard, but at the same time, the other part I learned from Coach Gady years ago, you if you coach them hard, you still got to talk to them, and and you got to the kids nowadays want to know why. I think if you can yeah. tell them why <clears throat> and explain it to them, they they react much better. You know, one of the things I always really enjoyed watching your teams interact with you personally. Um, you know, everyone watches the games and sort of that. I remember like your locker room stuff or anytime they'd be like a, a clip from practice or something. I always, you could always tell you had great relationship with your players. 
Um, and you always play with great discipline and, and toughness. And I feel like that's such a nuance to be able to, like you said, coach him hard, but know that you really care about him. And, and I thought I, I just always took a lot of that, you know, as a young coach, you're watching from a distance. So you're watching and I was like, man, that's really unique. His ability to connect. Um, did you get that from, from Gene Katie? Yeah, there's no doubt. I, it was the old school stuff. You know, he'd get after him pretty hard and kick guys out of practice. And I would go back up to the office and hear a guy he just belittled and got after and the whole bit. He's sitting in the office talking to him, laughing. And, and you know, he, uh, and one time this is one of the my learning lessons. And I got mad at one of our guys and he actually wasn't he's a good kid, but he just was a knucklehead and. And, you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm 24, 25 years old at that time. And I'm at Purdue with him. And I, I stopped talking to the young man and, you know, and finally coach grabbed me and he said, Hey, I heard you're mad at, you know, Ryan. And I said, yeah, he's a knucklehead, this and that. And he, and he looked at me and he just said, who's the adult and who's (laughs) who's the kid. And I, you know, it, it, I, you know, I just kind of sunk and, you know, and, and, I looked down and I said, I guess I'm the adult. He said, well, then act like one and talk to him. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of reached out that day and, you know, and then, and, and the, I think the, the young man appreciated it and he ended up having a great career for us. And, you know, but it was a lesson I learned. I, it's, you know, our guys uh, with my assistants, I talked about it all the time, that same lesson, um, hey, you get mad at them, that's fine. But call them in, watch film with them, talk to them. And, you know, if you want to get something out of it, uh, out of them, you know, you're going to have to reach them. And yeah. that's that one on one is really, really important. So it's something I definitely learned <laughs> from my old boss. And I think if you watch Coach Katie coach <laughs> in, the, oh, in the back in the day, you probably thought, you know, that guy probably doesn't even talk to his players. But Oh man, he had a great relationship with those guys. And, you know, 40, 50, 40 years later, uh, those, those players still love him. Uh, and it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, part of your previous basketball life as an assistant at Purdue there for 18 years, I believe it was. Yeah. I was with 19 years, one at Western Kentucky as a GA with Clem Haskins and, um, you know, Clem the gem and, and Ray Height was one of the other assistants. And, oh, wow. As an East Coaster, you might know Ray Hyde. He final uh, <laughs> played the uh, for Dean Smith and Morgan Wooden at the Massa. So we had some pretty good basketball knowledge in that at Western. <laughs> and then good fortune, Clem becomes the head coach. Ray stays at Western with Clem, and um, coach just comes to me and says, "Yeah, I'm a GA." And he goes, "Hey, you want to come with me to Purdue?" And I'm, I, I think, 22 years old, and I said, "Heck yeah!" and I wasn't making much money, but I was in heaven uh, being, you know, even at Western uh, and then getting a chance to go to Purdue after that. Yeah, I feel like those early years like shape us so much. And, you know, that first mentor, um, the value of that, you know, it's it's so interesting now because we have so many GAs, like so many programs have four or five GAs. Uh, Some of these programs have like 10 or 12 managers. I mean, they're just the numbers are so large now. I worry sometimes the quality of the mentoring um, gets lost where, you know, I think when I, even I was beginning and, you know, obviously I'm a little bit younger than you, but when I was beginning, there wasn't as many positions. Now it's just that these staffs are so large that it's harder to work your way up in some regards. I, I used to make fun. Actually, I, I did the other day with, when I was at K-State, I had so many guys, I didn't know what to do with them. (laughs) And, you know, basketball development position and, you know, because of the NCAA rules, you know, they can't, be on the court right how, do, how can you develop basketball if you can't be on the court but everyone else had it so we had it in in the big 12 all the co- uh, schools had it so we had one but i made it a basketball development was academics community service uh things like that career development things i i had them do that but i also as you said i wanted them to be involved as much as possible within the rules and i i tried to get them involved with scouting um, I tried to get them, keep them involved with all the meetings. When I started, uh, I was at Western Kentucky. We only had four coaches and uh, 
you know, I was the GA, the fourth guy, and but I could recruit, I could coach, I could be on the court, I could do everything and scout. We could scout in person. So my experiences and my, uh, you know, as you said, the mentorship, be, being with Coach Katie, being with Clem Haskins, Ray Hyde, or whoever it may be, um, you know, I, I learned so much from them and at that time. And 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 you are right. There are a lot of GA positions and uh, video guys and basketball development and, you know, whatever else positions they kind of think of now, advisors and all that stuff. And, you know, one of the things NABC is doing, uh, you probably know there, there's a mentor program um, I'm involved with. And I actually spoke to the group last week and just talked about the importance of getting as many experiences as you can to help yourself be ready to become a head coach. Everyone wants to be a head coach, but when you get that opportunity, if you're not ready, it's going to go very fast and you're never, you may never get that chance again. Yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting because every, like you said, everybody wants it. And then when you get it, it's like, do you know what to do with it? Um, yeah. And there's so many people that we've come across through the years that just got there and they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to handle different situations because so much of it isn't about basketball or isn't even about recruiting. It's like the stuff that comes to your desk and how you're able to handle that. Yes, there's no doubt. And that was one of the things I really uh, talked about last week when I uh, you know, was the speaker at this with the NABC with that mentor program that, you know, preparing to be a head coach, it's all the other stuff. It's it's dealing with the administration, dealing with boosters, uh, dealing with media, um, the academic part, you know, no, you know, making sure I was the academic advisor at, at Purdue. <laughs> For all the players, we only had, we had one academic advisor when I started for, you know, whatever it was, 500 some athletes in the university. So each, each, you know, I did study hall. I did all that type of thing, you know, help monitor their grades, checked on their classes, all that, anything you had to do. So, um, you know, dealing with camps, dealing with uh, travel plans, dealing with tickets, uh you know, dealing with scheduling, that was a big thing we talked about last week, how tough scheduling is. And as you know, um, it's it's really tough at the low and mid majors, but it's even tough at the high major because it, it really could determine what kind of season you have, how you schedule. So um, all those things are things that the more you can um, get any experience with that. And I encourage our, our my assistants I said, you come to work, if you just do what you're assigned, if you're the video guy and that's all you do, you're not going to grow. you got to you got to latch on to our recruiting guys and hang out with them. you got to, you know, watch on the court, you know, and practice and why are they doing this and talk to them and all that stuff. And so I think it's you got to help prepare yourself to be a head coach. So when you get there, as you said, you're ready and um, can deal with all those things that come up because every day there's. As you know, there's some crisis that comes up. My <laughs> wife called them basketball crisis. What's, somebody called or texted and woke us up, and you knew something was wrong. Yeah. It's it's weird. Like the, the COVID year, we text a little bit about the COVID year, um, and it was like everything was in crisis. Uh, and it was such like an overwhelming year, I would say for myself, um, because you're kind of, you know, I think through the years, you kind of get built to handle some of the basketball crisis. You know, you can kind of predict some of that stuff. And I feel like the COVID year just created, it was like a crisis every day in areas that we maybe weren't expertise in. I want to jump back in. You know, we talked a little bit about getting into coaching and, and you know, I, I read somewhere that you interviewed 22 times for head coaching jobs before you were hired. Um, what allowed you to just stay after it and, and not just dive into, I'm going to be an assistant coach the rest of the time? Well, you know, it, it, it's crazy because one, I was a real, I just very, very fortunate. I always said I was a miracle uh, started as a high school coach, my brothers, dad, everybody coached, our whole family were all educators. I was, I did elementary education, fifth grade. Uh, I taught for one year and, and helped in a high school um, in Milwaukee and actually had great mentors. When you talk about mentors, uh, the, the high school coaches, I was very fortunate to, two of the best in the history of Wisconsin basketball, um, actually several of them. And I got to work camps with them. Uh, Tom Desitel and is a legend in Wisconsin, Paul Nowak, uh, Ray Rozak, uh, that whole group uh, got to work around Rick Majerus uh, coming up on the playgrounds and the camps and all that stuff. Um, but I, 
you know, I got on as a grad assistant, you know, good fortune, um, you know, with coach Katie at Western, he goes to Purdue the next year. And I was one, I was the youngest assistant in the big 10 for about, I'm going to say eight years or seven <laughs> years. And, Cause at that time it was so different. Um, assistants were in there. You weren't getting a head coaching unless you were 40 or so. Um, mm. You know, I think I remember Billy Donovan might have been the first young guy that got hired and at, at that time. And, um, you know, so you had to pay your dues and work your way up. And so I, when I was interviewing those early ones, I, I I got interviews, but I was so young, they weren't hiring me. And then the one thing is, you know, you, you got to obviously have some connection with an administrator or something They usually get involved. Now it's agents and all that stuff. But you had to go to the Final Four, and at Purdue, we won six Big Ten championships, the most in the 80s and 90s. Uh, we did so many things, but we, Coach Katie, I just, that's my one regret. We never got to go to the Final Four, and it seemed like when guys went to the Final Four, they were the hot item, and and then I had to learn to interview, too. Um, I was I was told I'm too truthful. <laughs> I, had to, <laughs> I had to, you know, uh, you know, I, had a, I don't want to say lie, but I had to, you know, it, I guess change how my presentation and they helped me get involved with that. And so, um, and then I was going to be, then it got to a point I was going to be the head coach at Purdue. Um, that's what everybody had kind of told me. We ended up getting a new president. We ended up getting a new AD and they said, Oh, you gotta, you gotta prove yourself before we can do that. So I, you know, coach, coach Katie said, you better leave, you know, <laughs> so, you know, if you're going to have a chance to get, so I went to Southern Illinois and then ironically they called Purdue called back. I was at Southern for one year and they called back and said, come back. We want you to be the coach in waiting. And I said, I just moved my family. My girls cried for, for months. And now you're, and you know, I don't want to be the person to push coach Katie out. Obviously he meant so much to me in my life. So I didn't go back and, but I met with Coach Katie every year at the Final Four, and I say, "You, what do you think? Are you ready or not?" Because they every year they called me, and um, you know it ended up then the Illinois job popped open. I got to go to Illinois, and um, you know even then Purdue called, but you know it just ended up very, it, you know, great story from Matt Painter. Uh, yeah. He would be I coached him at recruited him and coached him at Purdue, and then uh, he was my assistant at Southern Illinois, and then took over for me after I went to Illinois and, and won. And then they brought Matt back as the coach in waiting. And obviously, a, you know, great story. Now, whatever fourth most wins in the history to big 10 or fifth or whatever it is. So, uh, you know, everyone's got, it's an interesting story. We, how things worked out, but obviously uh, I love being at Purdue. I love being at Southern Illinois, Illinois and K-State, all great places. Yeah. You had some of your Illinois teams were, were, some of the most fun teams I've, I I loved watching, uh, D will Luther head. Um, I mean, those teams are fun. D Brown. I mean, what fun teams those were to play. And I remember you played those guys all together Yeah, and it was like, really, the, I felt like it was the first time someone went like small ball, you know, like no one had done that before. They didn't think it'd work in the big 10. And, and, uh, what made you decide to go and do that? Well, you know, it's kind of funny because my assistants kind of all, say I never got credit for that you know Steve Kerr got all the credit and and I remember Steve Kerr when in between he was doing NCA games if you remember and as an announcer and and he had us or watched us a couple times and and then he ends up in the NBA kind of changing this the whole thing with the you know small ball and but when we were at Southern Illinois we had no choice we weren't as big um you know, our our five man was a four man. Our four man was a three man. Our three three man was a guard. You know, and so when we got there, those those three guys uh, came to meet the uh, D Brown and Darren Williams and Luther Head, and they just said, "Can we play together?" And I said two things. You know, you, somebody's got to be able to guard a bigger big guard or a small forward, and two, we got to rebound. And you know, they are all pretty good athletes, and actually, all were good. You know, rebounders. Even D Brown was had a great nose for the basketball. And uh, so we just went with them. And then Roger Powell wanted to play three. And I, I let him hang out with the guards for a, for a few weeks. And he came to me and he said, I don't know if I want to play here. 
<laughs> you know, when you're going against Darren Williams every day in practice, it's not very easy. So Roger ended up back at the four. James Augustine was really a four, but, yeah. you know, he had some length. And so we, you know, we just kind of went with it. And um, I guess I started something and, and never got credit, but it was fun. They, they passed the ball. They played so well together. When I talk at clinics and, um, and camps and that, that, you know, that group, uh, I think it was right. The the uh, media started talking about assists assist per field goals. And there yeah. were, we would have 20, 22, 24 assists on 28, 30 field goals. Every, almost every basket came off an assist. And um, they, and, you know, D was national player of the year. And I, I think he only averaged 15 or 16. Yeah. Darren Williams was the third pick in the draft and was either our third or third or fourth leading scorer. And he was the third pick in the draft. So um, all five of us starting lineup played in the NBA at some time. And so it, um, you know, it was a unique group, interesting group. It was, it was just a blast, but it wasn't easy. The beginning when I got there, Bill Self had left. They like, they loved Bill Self. I had to kind of fight my way into their hearts, but once <laughs> we got going, um, it, we were actually two and three in the Big Ten, um, got our butts kicked by Wisconsin, and then something clicked. It was early January, and we ended up winning the Big Ten out, uh, you know, on our own that year. Went on an unbelievable run, and I, if you can look it up, I, I don't know exact number, but we were like 52 and four, something like that, five maybe, in, in a stretch. Uh, over to that from that January all the way through the next year. So it was, it was uh, pretty, it was a lot of fun. There's no doubt. Yeah. You went 26 and seven, your first year, 37 and two, the second year and 26 and seven, the third year. Um, I, I would say those are pretty, pretty good years <laughs> in terms of, of, of wins. I'm sure they're, they're a lot of work, I'm sure. Um, but I mean, and watching those teams play, I mean, you talk about assists per, per basket, I just remember how fast you were. It, like, if one of those guards got the rebound, it was a problem defensively. I mean, it was guys were out on the break. And I remember watching Deron Williams thinking, man, this guy's amazing. Like, how's D Brown the national player of the year? And Deron Williams is like just a big guard and making plays. It was, you know, the best teams sort of end up that way. Yeah. You know, where, where, you know, maybe the maybe, maybe the most talented guy third picking a draft just is so unselfish that everybody sort of plays really well. If you go back to our final four game against Louisville, I, I think Darren might have scored uh, four points in the game, uh, like early field goal and some free throws at the end, but he dominated the game. And that was the game Roger Powell had an unbelievable game. Yeah. He played well. Uh, we beat him pretty <clears throat> and, um But – when media asked, uh, you know, who, they said, we want Darren. And and I'm like, you know, I'm looking, Roger's got 25. So, <laughs> but he, you know, he guarded the best player. Um, he, he might have had eight or 10 assists. Some, I can't remember exact yeah. numbers, but, you know, he was, he just had a great feel for the game. And, um, you know, just, he taught me, a, really, he taught me about basketball, his vision, his understanding of the ball screens, that was all ball screen basketball was yeah. just kind of starting in the college uh, at that time. And Darren just, he loved the game. He, you know, he studied the game. All those guys, they, they had fun like college students, but after we played, they go watch film, they go shoot and then they go have a little fun. Yeah. And they were back at it the next morning. And uh, you know, it, it, it's and even in the NBA, Darren would call back early, you know, and say, Coach, I, I got to go to a few games and they're in the playoffs and things. And you know, he, you know, he just knew the game, he just understood it. And his, you know, I, I'd like, golly, it's amazing. He had eyes in the back of his head because he see things I didn't even see. Yeah. When, how, how soon when you got there did you realize that he was really, really special? Um, you know, you kind of, he was a little chunky when I got there. I, I called him Pillsbury Doughboy. We had to get some weight off him. Um, but you just, his, you know, you just didn't realize how good he was until you started practice. And, um, and then even Luther, Luther was, you know, all three of those guys started in the NBA at, at some point at the point guard. So 
that was the un, other unusual thing. You know, I think at that, you know, the old school basketball, when I first started, you know, you had your point guard, you had your two guys, they all had little roles. And we just, that versatility of all those guys and even a Roger Powell yeah. uh, who could get a rebound and push it and really cause havoc for defenses. I think it, uh, you know, as we, we just kind of grew and developed as a team. Yeah. You go, you know, you go 210 wins at Illinois, tons of success. And then you get the opportunity at Kansas state, which has, I don't know if people realize what the tradition Kansas state has in, in history of basketball. What was attractive about Kansas state to you besides just the history? Well, you know, that's coach Katie's alma mater. Um, he always talked to me about K state. And obviously when he was there, uh, Tex winter was the coach yeah. and, and, you know, when you talk about their tradition, they they had Final Fours, but that was uh, way back in the 50s and 60s. And that was when Tex was there. And Tex was assistant on two Final Fours, and then he was a head coach on two. And then obviously Jack Hartman after that um, had an unbelievable run there. Uh, never got to the Final Four, but, you know, great name. Took Actually started, ironically, started at SIU like I did and then went to K-State. Um, it was Walt Fraser at SIU and they, they played Marquette in the finals of the NIT way back. And, um, I still remember that game watching as a kid. Uh, so it, it, uh, you know, it, it, it was a good place and, um, we were fortunate. They, they had not won a big 12 championship. Obviously Kansas has been pretty dominant, um, but they hadn't won one in 36 years. And then we were fortunate to win one. And then, win another one. Um, so it was a, it was a great experience. We really loved being there. It was a difficult recruiting place. There's no doubt. Uh, I was going to ask you that. I was going to like, I, I always wonder that, like they've always had good teams. They've always had, you know, but how do you recruit there? Yeah, it's, um, it's hard. There's no doubt. Um, you had to work really hard. I, I flew on American airlines 150 times, uh, <laughs> almost every year that I was there. So we had to get guys from all over. You just didn't have the recruiting base because Kansas, you know, has 3 million people and you've got three major schools there, Kansas, Wichita and K-State, Nebraska, you're, you know, surrounding states, Nebraska, uh, Iowa, Missouri, you know, just not, especially on that, that, those, that Western parts of those states and Nebraska's only got 2 million people. So, and then Oklahoma to the South, you know, you got two schools there and not a big population. So we had to go everywhere. Um, you know, we, we went into Texas. We actually had a good little niche in Florida. We went out East and, um, you know, my assistants, you know, Chester Fraser was a East coast guy and, um, he played for me at Illinois. So I hired him, Chris Lowry kind of did Midwest. And then I got a Texas guy and, Alvin Brooks was the first one and um, who's now at back at Baylor. But, uh, you know, that that was kind of how we we did it. And we had to develop them uh, to be on. None of our guys we had, you know, Wesley Wandu wasn't even in the top 50 in Texas playing the NBA. And Dean Dean Wade, you know, wasn't a top 100 guy starts in the for the Cavs until his injury. And, um, you know, so we had, you know, we had just we found some guys. Xavier Sneed's the D League right now. And. Uh, Rodney Magruder still with the Pistons, and so we, we, we took a lot of pride in developing guys, and and you know helping them develop, and from the weight room to the skill development to understanding the game. Yeah, it's it's funny. I was actually discussing with someone the other day about Kansas State and like TCU, how they're really good football jobs because football is such a numbers game, and you can take so many two and three star recruit guys, and like you're talking about in the development stage. You can bring so many of those players in and it's just a numbers game of guys developing, improving. You know, you can have, you know, 10 slot receivers that are five foot 10 to five, six foot one. And if two of them work out for you, you're going to be able to have a successful slot receiver, right? Basketball is so different because at the top end, there's just, you're either good enough or you're not. And so that's like a really tricky thing in hoops is that you got to develop a guy like Dean Wade, who's six, nine, six, 10. And he's got to now become in your window, you know, a 40% three point shooter and rebound the ball seven, eight times a game. It's just so much harder in hoops than maybe in football. Yeah, there's no doubt. And Bill Snyder, what he did at K State, you know, Amazing. they're going to go one double A. Uh, Coach Snyder get, took it over. They, you can look at, there's a video of the miracle in Manhattan. Um, you know, they were the worst, they were the first team. And I, and he had the picture in his office. 
uh, on cover of Sports Illustrated, K State was the first team to lose 500 football games, wow. and it, it's uh, so he had that picture. K State hits all time low, loses 500 on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and he takes it over. Comes from Iowa, Hayden Fry. Um, but he did an unbelievable job there. I don't know if you know, in Kansas, there's eight man football because they don't have enough students in some of these smaller towns and no one would recruit those areas. And he brought them in. He was the one who started gray shirting. Mm -hmm. They brought guys there and they didn't start school right away until the spring. They called them gray shirts and they take two classes and, you know, work out, get in the weight room, uh, things like that. And then they would start school because football's on that different cycle and they'd redshirt that January, you know, a whole nother year. And then by the time they're 22, 20, <laughs> they're pretty good players. It's like they had a COVID year before COVID was, so, <laughs> but guys like, I mean, un, you just, there's guys, Oh, Jordy Nelson's a great name. He was a walk on yeah. at a state. He, and that was the other thing. He took these guys as walk on and, they worked their way up to a scholarship. And I mean, there's other, I've met a bunch of them that I think there's one that was a walk on that was, is in the uh, NFL hall of fame football. So it's just kind of, it's, it's amazing what he did. Uh, yeah. It was really cool to watch it and, and to hear all the stories. Yeah. And football is so different. I think 65%, I've read the stats where 65% of the NFL are third rounders or, or later. Yeah. Like, well, um, and that's like a, you know, you think that it's like the determination of those guys and it's just, it's just such a different thing, you know? And I think in the NBA, it's probably flipped, right? I mean, it's just so yeah. many top guys. In the NBA, it's hard, um, especially the main guys, the superstars, it seems like, you know, they, they give those guys more opportunity because they draft them and they put so yeah. much money into them. And uh, the NBA guys always, I always say, why do you play the young guys? And they say, we have to, we want to keep our job. <laughs> <laughs> The owners, you know, they okayed the draft. And so it's, um, yeah, it is, it's a little different. But I think if you really study the NBA, there's a lot of guys from eight to 15 on those rosters that, you know, work their way up. You know, to, maybe they're not superstars, but they work their way up where they long term guys might. Rodney Magruder is a great example. Um, you know, he's, what is it now, eight, eight, nine years in the league. Um, you know, and just does it by, you said the word determination and, um, you know, and I think Dean Wade can be a long time guy. He, he can just stay healthy because he, he knows how to play He's smart. He doesn't, you know, the cab staff just say he, you know, he just does his job and that's yeah. what you try to emphasize to your guys, stay in the league, you know, be a great teammate, um, be ready every day, be a professional and and stay healthy and you can stay in it a long time yeah i was um you know we're, we're preparing to do this interview I, I wanted to watch a bunch of your press conferences from last year and i came up to one of your one of your your final one um at the at at big at big 12 and i i, I wanted to ask you this how were you able through all the years ups and downs success failure recovery how are you able to keep such a jovial spirit with the media you know and how are you able to do that? You know, it's kind of interesting. I, I don't go on any social media, so I don't know. Everyone says, well, how do you deal with it? And I, I don't know. I don't know what people are saying. I don't care. Once in a while, my assistants, SID, would say, hey, coach, this may come up because it's been in the paper, or, you know, been on the radio or whatever. You better be ready for it. So, I, I mean, just, just me as a person, I, you know, it, it's funny. Every place I've left and I've got let go a couple times um the media who would criticize me would send me text messages and tell me how much they appreciated me and i i i've saved some of the ones from illinois i there was like six or seven of them obviously there was great attention there but some of these guys you know would get you know in the you know i i didn't always read everything but you read some stuff but because people said you should just to be prepared you know they would kill me but then they'd send me a text message and tell me how much they appreciate what i'd done all this stuff and i'm like wait a minute you just wrote an article <laughs> so i i don't know i just see the good in people and i you know i i don't you know i don't know it's just but that that last press conference i um i had that mentally prepared for a while and um 
you know, I was, I, I try not to brag about myself. Um, that's one thing I, I probably, one of my, I guess it's a good thing, but it's also a negative because you have to promote yourself. And, um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm proud of what we've accomplished in my career and, um, and we, you know, we've had pretty good success over the years. Yeah. Well, it's been super fun to, to watch. Um, are you done? I mean, is there any chance you're going to make a comeback here? Uh, you know, we'll see. It, it, it would have to be the right situation. Um, you know, my wife has sacrificed. We, you know, we've been married now. She's been part of college basketball for a long, long time. 40, whatever she, we got married 41 years ago, I think it is. And I better figure that out before the first <laughs> week. But, uh, you know, and, and we got grandkids now. I, I love the game. I love coaching. I love practice. I, I love preparing for practice. One of my favorite times the coaches would go, you know, eat lunch or work out. I just grab my apple and pretzels and I'd sit down and write my practice practice plan. And, you know, for me, it was my masterpiece for the day, you know, and just, um, you know, so that I miss all that stuff and the interaction, the, the good, the one thing is we talked about earlier, the TV has kept me involved. And then I have a lot of guys that are out there coaching and, and they still call, you know, quite frequently. And, you know, I have guys that have, you know, even from managers to GAs, like you talk about, they're all over the country. And so it's good to, you know, they call for advice or just the talk. And so that part, you know, I enjoy too. So I, you know, I've said this many times, we don't help young coaches and our business. I've said it, not just, um, you, you talked a little bit about the mentorship and the different positions and things. Um, but we also, we do a horrible job of using the older coaches Yeah, uh, and football does a better job and they have those positions, advisors, consultants. I don't even know what the heck they are. But they have older guys there that you don't have to recruit. In our business, you know, recruiting is so much, uh, or I'm sorry, our, you know, staffs are so much about recruiting. Yeah. But you, it would be nice to have an older coach that uh, that has some wisdom that can help, you know, and he doesn't want to go on the road and chase young guys around, I guess. But, uh, you know, so I, 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 hopefully we can make some progress with that. And I know it's something – I've talked to Matt Painter, who's involved with NABC quite a bit. We've we both agree that if we could do do something like that, it would be great. But uh, you know, we'll see. I guess that you know, if something something pops up that makes sense, we'll get back in. If not, um, we'll see if we can stay involved. And I, I was coaching four year old uh, or helping with four year old <laughs> soccer, my grandkids and basketball, and we'll be doing some drills at Christmas in the in the basement. <laughs> Working on, we're working on that crossover right to left with the four-year-olds. <laughs> well, they'll definitely be taught well. I, I got one final question for you. Um, we do this thing on last call. It, it's, so to speak, it's the end of the night. I don't know if you have a beer or two at the end of the night or a glass of wine. But it's the end of the night. The place is shutting down. Um, on your left side, you've got someone who's retired. They could be deceased. Um, who you want to be with. And a person on your right who's still kicking and doing their job. What two people do you want with you at the end of the night having a convo with? You know, I had the opportunity to be around Coach Wooden. Um, you know, one, just ironically, I was I used to keep take notes, Medalist Industries before. It was a Milwaukee organization that ran clinics. Um, it was uh, Al McGuire actually was part of it. Oh. And so I got to uh, I was taking notes 19 years old and at the clinic and made a booklet. I still have my first booklet that that I help, uh, you know, just take notes where I didn't write it, obviously. But um, I got to walk with Coach Wooden, and then we went to Purdue, and we honored him several times. So he would be definitely uh, somebody that uh, I, I would love to, you know, just have another opportunity to talk to. Um, you know, somebody that's still kicking. I love Coach Katie, my old boss. He, I almost talk to him every day. Um, but, you know, just, just appreciate – I'm going to do the game tonight. Tom Izzo, oh, wow. uh, my really good friends. And, uh, you know, it, it would, it's, I'm going to go meet with him here in a little bit and just uh, amazing what he's done at Michigan State. And he loves it. I keep saying, you know, it seems like he's miserable, but he loves misery, <laughs> I think. He loves, that's part of coaching, as you know. So 
those would be two guys that uh, really love to be around. I love it. I love it. Well, Coach, I appreciate you taking the time. You've been an amazing guest. Um, we want to wish you continued success on all things you're going to do here. And uh, just thanks for all you've done for the game. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on The Last Call, powered by Speakeasy, where careers grow through relationships and relationships grow through Speakeasy. We hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to connecting with you soon.